What it is, my Tenno Peace and Grease here. And I uh, was had an idea for a video series that I was calling The Pursuit for MR30. Because as you can see, I am extremely close to MR30. That's the good news. Bad news is I only have a limited number of ways I can actually gain more MR. Because after playing this game for six and a half years, well, I guess that's more now. I've only got about three different ways I can actually earn more MR. So the first one we're going to be talking about today is the Steel Path. Now, has my opinion of the Steel Path changed? No, I still think it is probably one of the most least rewarding game modes in the entirety of Warframe. So everything I said in my initial video actually stand. However, with that being said, now that I have completed Steel Path, it does seem as if the drop rate of Steel Essence has improved substantially over the Steel Path at launch. At launch, I did about the first six locations, Earth, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Ceres, and the Orchid Derelict. Of course, now it's called Deimos. And I had a grand total of a whopping three Steel Essence, not counting what Testion provides for clearing a planet. After completing the Steel Path now, I have a total of about 78. Of course, that is taking into account that Teshin does give you two per planet that you clear. Now that is definitely a start to say the least. And as far as proposed changes go, well there's good news. DE is talking about removing the Steel Essence from the Eximus enemies and putting them in an alert style system, something similar to what you see here with Kuba Sipens and Kuba Plutz. Now the number being thrown around is about a hundred Steel Essence per week, if you do all of your weeklies and all of your dailies. And I think that's a really good thing. This is a really positive change. The downside, however, is that DE is going to be unintentionally screwing over a segment of the population that is, you know, playing their game mode, Steel Path. And I don't think these people should really be penalized. I think that, if anything, they should be rewarded. So while the alert system is good, and I think they should go ahead with that, I also think that they should have rotating locations every week where players could actively farm Steel Essence. As an example, maybe it would be Odin on Mercury this week and Io on Jupiter. The players could actually go in and actively run those missions and earn, actively earn that Steel Essence. Maybe next week it'll be Helene on Saturn and it'll be Hydron on Sedna as an example. That way, those players, if they still want to actively farm the Steel Essence and the Steel Path, they can do that. You're not penalizing them, but you're also improving the game mode because people that don't really want to actively farm the Steel Essence can just simply run the alerts. I think that's a fair compromise. Now, there is some bad news here because if you're looking at this and you're thinking, this is great because I won't have to actually, you know, run the Steel Path, I'll just do the alerts and get the Steel Essence, yeah, that's not going to work. So if you see a mission here like uh, this uh, Sedna mission on Kappa, that's a spy mission for this alert, if you haven't got your Steel Path star chart cleared up to Sedna so that you could actually run this Kappa spy mission, you're not going to be able to do that alert. So if you're not working on your steel path, it may be a good time to consider doing so. Now, on a side note, something I'd like to point out that I found very interesting is the fact that back when the steel path had dropped, a couple of my buddies needed help with some specific missions, and I jumped in and helped them out. They had to taxi me there, I helped them complete the mission, and they got it done. Oddly enough, though, when I actually recently completed my Steel Path, those missions were not done for me, which I found peculiar. Because taxiing a player in the regular part of Warframe is a thing. So it should be a thing in Steel Path. If a player taxis me to a location and we complete a mission, that location should be done and unlocked, which that doesn't seem to be happening. Now, I will say that really, the Steel Path wasn't that hard. I ended up doing all of Steel Path solo, but keep in mind, that's not what this video was about. That's not what I set out to do. But to be blunt, matchmaking has never been Warframe's strong suit. 
and Steel Path really highlights that. After many attempts of trying to get a squad on numerous missions, being told there's seven open squads here, six here, three over there, four here, five there, and never, ever getting a squad. Moreover, never having anybody join my squad. Out of frustration, I finally just said, to hell with it, I'll do it my damn self. And that's exactly what I did. And I ended up doing all of Steel Path solo, by myself. With one exception. I did grab a buddy on Jupiter for the Ropa Lolis. Now, I firmly believe this can be done solo. But, after several attempts of getting extremely close of getting this done, I got pissed off and just got frustrated and grabbed a buddy and, and we knocked it out two-man style. Very easy to do. The problem with the Ropa Lolis is that there's a time limit, about 15 minutes, give or take. On top of which, there's a time waster, and that is the distance that the Ropa Lolas keeps from the player when you're trying to do the whole zappy-zappy thing with the operator amp. It would come in close enough, you would zap it a couple times with the operator amp, and it would fly away. Now keep in mind, I have about half a dozen amps at my disposal, not counting the amps I built, didn't like, and trashed. And even my long-range amps weren't capable of consistently hitting the Ropa Lolas and depleting its shield at that range. I was even trying to arc my shots from my amp like a basketball into the Ropa Lolist, and I couldn't consistently do that. So I definitely think this needs to be tuned a little bit by DE, either increase the time limit or decrease the distance that the Ropa Lolist can hang back. And I think that would fix that right up. I even went to the extent of running the Mutalist Alad V Assassinate and the Jordis Golem solo took me about five less than five minutes each, so not a problem there. So yeah, did all of Steel Pass solo, didn't intend to, obviously with the exception of the Ropa Lolist. And it's really not that hard. If you're comfortable running the third part of the sortie solo, and you go into each one of these missions with that mentality, I really don't think you'll have any problem at all. Now I know somebody's going to ask me this question, so let me clear it up right now. And that is... The worst missions on the Steel Path. Well, I just mentioned one, but keep in mind the Ropa Lois isn't hard. It's not a difficult mission, it's just that time limit and that time waste that's the real issue. But in truth, the real is the biggest problem, the missions I hated the most on the Steel Path, which believe it or not would have changed prior to me completing the Steel Path and now that I have, and that is interception missions. Now this is ironic considering the fact I actually liked interception missions in the regular game despite all of their flaws and they do have many flaws <laughs> and in fact the entire community as well as DE has known about these flaws for literal years but D really this the steel pack puts a spotlight on those flaws from enemies being able to cap a point in a split second where it takes you a full minute standing there like a schmuck trying to cap a point to the game literally spawning enemies out of doors right next to you to stop your progress on capturing a point. Two points, conflict locking. If the game, for whatever reason, connects an enemy to a, sp a particular capture point, either above, below it, or across the damn map, it'll lock that point, give it to the enemy, yet another advantage for the enemy, and you can't contest it. And that's just the tip of the icebergs. So how did I combat that, and how did I complete my interception missions? Well, there's a lot of ways you can go about doing this. I used Vobin. In a word, Vobin. And he was brilliant at this, because really what I could do is go into an interception mission, I could cap a point, before I left, I would throw down a Bastille, and then go and capture a second point. At this rate, enemies are going to be hell-bent on capturing that first point, while I'm over here minding my own business capturing the second point, I can also trigger that Bastille into a Vortex, delaying the enemies even longer. And it worked beautifully. After capturing the second point, I would go back to the first point, throw down another Bastille, and go capture a third point. So really, it was just a matter of capturing all four points and then chasing the enemy around the map as they tried to capture zones. Throwing down Bastilles, Vortexes, Nades, yeah, use what you like and you'll always be right, but for me, Bobbin worked wonderfully in this case. Now, as far as other frames that I used, well, 
I did typically use the obligatory type of defense frames for some defense missions, mobile defense missions or excavations. It's just kind of dependent on the situation. When it came to a lot of missions, surprisingly, I ended up using Loki. I know, surprised me too. I used him more than, for this, than just the standard spy and rescue missions. I ended up using him for a lot, pretty much every sabotage mission. Some exterminate, some sabotage, assassinates. And, you know, he worked well. The whole idea here is if the problems are the enemy's resistances due to their level, well, then let's just, you know, bypass the enemies. And, you know, what can you say? Loki worked great for that. As far as weapons go, I did rely pretty extensively on the Kuva weapons. Moreover, the Kuva Comb. A couple times I did switch to the Tigris Prime or other weapons when I got bored. As far as secondaries go, yeah, the Kuva Nucor is always the answer. In fact, next time you're having a meeting with your boss and he asks you a question, just tell him or her Kuva Nucor. It's, it's always the right answer. <laughs> or if you're in school and you have a test, just write Kuva Nucor for every answer. Trust me, you'll get him right. <laughs> No, but it really wasn't because the Kuba Nucor was killing the enemies. It was more the mass confusion that it caused. I could zap a group of enemies with the Kuba Nucor, and they would just entirely ignore me. I could have redecorated their whole damn base if I really wanted to, and they probably wouldn't have noticed. That's what makes the Kuba Nucor so brilliant. It removes the enemies as a threat or an issue in a mission. Uh, the next thing, as far as melees go, yeah, I use Grand Prime quite a lot. I think I used it about 20%. No. Yeah, 99.9% .9 of the time I ended up using the Grand Prime. It was it was brilliant, man. The Grand Prime is still great after all this time. Sadly, I still I don't have a ribbon mod any longer. Which sucks, but it's still great. Even without a ribbon mod, I use it a lot. Although there was one mission that I did switch off the Grand Prime, and I did go to the Fragger Prime. And that mission is Hades. Now, why? Because, well, this is the Ambulus mission, and, you know, the Ambulus doesn't give two craps about slash damage, so it does care about impact damage. So, there are a lot of great melee weapons out there that deal a significant amount of impact damage, but I really wanted something that had really good crit and impact, and that was the Fragger Prime. As you can see here, I'm sitting on a 128% crit chance with a 6.3 crit multiplier, and I'm sitting on over 1,327 impact. I am running Shattering Impact because impact damage is going to reduce enemy armor as well as Primed Heavy Trauma for more impact. What can I say? The Fragger Prime worked beautifully. And if you're having trouble with the Hades mission on the Steel Path, give a melee weapon with a significant amount of impact a try and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Now, with all of that said, the only other real complaint that I have, but it's not really a complaint because, well, there's no solution, and that is Ribbon Slivers. Let's, now, don't misunderstand me here. I get that Ribbon Slivers are another alternative to gaining Ribbon Mods, so you can now gain a Ribbon Mod via the Sortie, as well as trading in Ribbon Slivers. I get that. The system continues to fall into but chaos. Ribbon Slivers are Check really kind of like the door prize that nobody wants. You can earn Ribbon Slivers from Arbitration. You can earn Ribbon Slivers from Requiem Relics. You can earn Ribbon Slivers from the Steel Path. Did you know you could even earn Ribbon Slivers from Railjack? Yeah, I know. I, it's not a common occurrence. All the Railjack I played, I've only seen Ribbon Slivers drop like once or twice. But yeah, they can drop. So the issue here is this is that door prize nobody wants. Essentially, with Ribbon Slivers, you would gather 10 of them, and you would take them down to Earth, uh, to the Iron Wake, and trade in those 10 Ribbon Slivers to Paladino, and she would turn them into a Ribbon Mod. The problem here is that, you know, the Sortie exists, so I can bypass this whole silly Ribbon Sliver mechanic, and just run the Sortie and have a chance to get a Ribbon Mod. Done. So that's part of the problem. The other problem is that DE tries to give the illusion that these ribbon slivers are like these magnificent rewards and they're just really not uh, they never kind of really have been take for example requiem relics when I'm running requiem relics I'm running them because I want the requiem mods 
getting anything other than those Requiem mods make me feel like I'm running my, wasting my relics, I'm wasting my reactant, and I'm wasting my time. So really, in this case, Ribbon Slivers, a kick in the mouth. Steel Path. I'm running the Steel Path for the Steel Essence. That's what I'm running it for. And when I see a Ribbon Sliver, it's like, hey, look, you could have had a chance to get a st true, uh, Steel Essence, but instead, all you got was this lousy t-shirt. Oh, I mean, uh, Ribbon Sliver. Same thing goes for Arbitration. I'm running a for Vitus Essence, and getting Ribbon Slivers is, again, kind of a kick in the mouth there. Now, don't get me wrong, as I said at the beginning, I get that this is an alternative to earn more Ribbon Mods. Totally understand that. And quite honestly, there's really no solution here. Could DE actually put anything in its place that would actually be better? Probably not. I mean, historically, DE was really bad about giving you this poultry amount of endo. And uh, it could be that bad. You know, oh, you didn't get what you want, kid? Here, here's 50 plats. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the MO of DE. So, yeah, it could be that bad. So I guess in that, in that line of thinking, ribbon slivers, not too bad. Uh, but they still are the door prize you're not really looking for or wanting. I do think that they are too expensive. Ten ribbon slivers, yeah, that should be knocked down to five. I think that that would help improve at least the appearance of ribbon slivers. But as it stands, I never feel good about getting ribbon slivers. I'm never happy about getting ribbon slivers. I don't think ever one time I've said, oh, hey, look, uh, ribbon slivers. Maybe if they were in the, the regular part of the game, it would be... Be kind of become a system in which I would be like, oh, hey, look, more ribbon slivers. But it, unfortunately, they seem to be reserved for, air quotes, special game modes. Anyway, with all that said, I did finish the Steel Path. Unfortunately, not enough MR. So I will have to move on to part two to see if I can get the uh, required MR to get to MR30 to witness those mastery rank changes. So keep your eyes peeled if you care about that. If you don't, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> Let me know what you think down in the comment section. I love hearing from you guys and gals, and I try to respond to everybody that leaves a comment. And until next time, peace out.